Well, Dana, it's so good to have you on today. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you doing over there? I'm doing great. It's a little warm today. It's 40, so we're kind of enjoying the sunshine and watching the <laughs> snow melt. So, <laughs> I, Same here. <laughs> Great. So I love to ask my guests a question, kind of get to know you a little bit better. So what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? All right. Well, I don't know about the best because I think that we all gather little bits and pieces of life as we go along in it. But I sure. think one of the biggest pieces um, that comes from my great grandma, actually, she always told me to listen to my gut. She said that was my guardian angel whispering in my ear. So whatever you call it, I have found that when I go against it, it, it things don't work out as well as they could have. So I, I'm a firm believer in, in just listening to that inner voice or whatever that is that speaks to you. Just listen to that gut. Yeah, I agree with that. That that sometimes intuition is a powerful thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I agree with her. You know, I always like to ask my guests, you know, if you think about the different phases of our lives, there are people who kind of drift in and out. But who are some people that serve to maybe inspire you in your life? My great grandma was the primary influence for me. And, you know, without getting too deeply into my 48 years of life, it was because she was my first um, and, and perhaps my my only for for decades um, experience with love, um, you know, because I was born to a mother that she was a teenager unwed, you know, at a time that that wasn't socially acceptable, um, you know, uh, so it was difficult having you know, a mother that was emotionally detached from me and not really soothing or nurturing or encouraging or affectionate and all these things you imagine a mother to be. But my great grandma, I was with her for the first few years of my life um, until my mother could kind of get herself on her feet for both of us. And so I really appreciated just having that sense of what motherhood really should be and knowing what love was because the rest of my life, unfortunately, I was in one abusive situation after another. But I think what always brought me back to myself was remembering that I was worthy of love and knowing what love really looked like versus what I was being shown. Wow, that's powerful because, you know, especially when you come from a difficult background, Sometimes there aren't those people that show you love. And so you when to have that at some point in your life is something that's just invaluable to kind of be able to move us through to see this is what it's supposed to look like. Exactly. Hold on a second. Someone's buzzing me. <laughs> okay. No, I'll get it to you today. Yeah, you can. Oh, if you, if you, if you want to send out, you can. You know, wait, and I'll send out, I'll send out something all the rest. All right. Sounds good, Joe. Yep. I'll, I'll send it to you to send out for me. All right. Thanks. Bye. Sorry about that. That's <laughs> Usually okay. my phone doesn't ring when I'm on. So, <laughs> all right. No worries. On my end here. Um, <laughs> all right. So Dana, I'm always curious to kind of share with us kind of your personal journey. I know part of that's in your book, but whatever kind of helps us to kind of get to how you got up to where you wrote your book? Um, well, again, that that's like my lifelong story. But um, the short version of that is that, you know, I as I just mentioned, I came out of a not the greatest kind of a childhood. My mother, I did go to live with her um, when she met somebody that she was going to marry. Um, it was really difficult, though, because he didn't want me any more than she did. And he was verbally and physically abusive. And she enabled and excused it um, and and sort of tried to get me to submit and tolerate it like she was. Um, and I was just a little girl. So, I mean, I, I sensed it was wrong. I knew that people that say they love you shouldn't treat you the way that I was being treated. But it was really difficult more than anything, I, I, and I'm not dismissing the severity that physical abuse, uh, you know, can can have an impact on on the victim. But 
for me, the physical was the least of my worries. It was the verbal abuse of every day being told that nobody wanted me, that I shouldn't even exist. And that, you know, my stepfather would say he shouldn't have to pay for another man's child. And I was a burden and my existence was bothersome. And, you know, having been raised, um, you know, my great grandma, you know, raised me in the Catholic faith, you know, so I struggled with God through a lot of my preteen and teen years, you know, like if I was, I just put here to suffer. If I, if this was my life, what, I mean, should I even exist? I, you know, and to say that I wasn't depressed or anxious and all the other things that, that you feel in that kind of a situation. So I struggled growing up, but um, they definitely didn't want me around. And I took the hint and, you know, left as soon as I legally could at 18 and I swore I was never going to let anyone treat me like that again. But then the first person sure. that came along yeah. because I was so starved for any bit of affection or love, I, you know, went against that gut instinct that the second I met him, boy, I felt it deep inside. I thought, oh, he reminds me of my stepfather. That's not a good thing. And I, I told myself to walk away, but there was nobody else you know, I, I mean, I'm just going to say, I, I mean, I was young, I was desperate because nobody else was giving me attention or the time of day or anything. And I lived by myself in my own apartment. And I mean, my cat loved me, but, you know, we all want that human interaction and, and you know, that affection of, of another human, that connection. Um, and it's unfortunate. I ended up spending 25 years of my life with that man. Um, despite how I felt, because that gut instinct proved right, right from the beginning. And what eventually motivated me to write my book was that by the end of the 25 years with him, um, what had actually compelled me to end our marriage was that I became physically ill. I did not realize that stress really could kill you, um, but it came to the point where I, I had spent over a year having every test done, going to every specialist, the amount of money that, that I spent on all this just for every doctor to throw their arms up and say, we don't know, we, we can't figure it out. We can give you a pill for your symptom, but I had two dozen symptoms. It was at the point where I had a spreadsheet of my random symptoms because nobody could figure out how they were all related. They were cardiovascular, neurological, um, you know, digestive, muscular, I, everything, my body was in an influx. But what was most alarming to me was that I had dropped down to 93 pounds within two weeks. I mean, I always was small and I always was healthy, but 93 pounds is, is I was skeletal. That's a Halloween decoration. That's not a, a 40 some year old woman. Um, I also could not breathe. I couldn't, my vision was going, I was blacking out. I, my hands were going numb. I mean, my to say my digestive system was slow, I mean, it just wasn't functioning at all. I was having heart issues. It finally took a neurologist and a functional medicine doctor to figure out, they got me with Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic figured out that I had so much cortisol, which is a stress hormone, running through me and at such high rates for so long, decades really since my childhood, that I had become autoimmune. My white blood cells had thought that they, there was something in my body they had to eradicate, that they eradicated themselves. So I was autoimmune. And then the scratchiness you hear in my voice is a lung syndrome. Never smoked a cigarette in my life. Um, I, I've been a runner for many, many years, even coached cross country for nine years at my son's grade school. But here I am with a lung disease that the doctor says is like having COPD and fibromyalgia all at once, which sort of connected all the dots of all these symptoms I was having. But the sad thing was, is that there was no pillar surgery anybody could give me that I had three doctors say, it's your lifestyle that needs to change. There's some part of your life causing you all this distress that, you know, you have to make a change. And that's when I realized, you know, it was actually that night after one of my doctors sat me down and said, your body is dying. You, you are barely living. Your body's doing everything just to keep your heart beating and your lungs going. But 
he said, this isn't life. You need to really think about what you want and, and how you want to live because this is going to end up taking your life if you don't. And that's when I realized that I had to have enough self-respect and self-love to get myself out of my situation. I thought I was being a faithful person by staying in a marriage, especially when I had known what I'd gotten myself into. I thought I was being noble by keeping the family together for our son. I thought I was, you know, making a sacrifice, I guess, of my life, you know, being the sacrificial lamb, so to speak, you know, to just keep peace and keep things going. And, and you know, but it wasn't worth my life. And when I really thought about it, I, I had to believe that God would forgive me. And in the end, the beautiful thing was, was that, you know, here I was sick, COVID hit right about this point, because this was early in 2020. We went into a shelter in place, so I couldn't file for divorce because the courts were closed down. They were backed up anyway. And I was stuck in the house with this man, and he had made threats against my life on top of everything else. Um, the abuse had had escalated to the point of domestic violence, in fact. And so I was actually afraid that he was going to kill me, make it look like an accident. It was COVID, so who would know, who would question it? The world had bigger things to worry about. Um, so I started keeping a journal of everything that was going on. And that journal is essentially what became my book, which covers that 25 years that I spent with him from start to finish. Um, and it was done because I think that people don't realize that, you know, not just listening to your gut, but listening to your body, because my body was like screaming out, um, you know, that that we needed help, that that the situation was toxic and it wasn't healthy. And the beautiful thing to bring this back to God, honestly, was that as a faithful person who had been so worried about committing this terrible sin of, you know, getting a divorce, at least in my faith, that was what the consideration, I realized that God had actually put this all in my path to begin with. He had meant for me to be here absolutely 100%, despite what my stepfather said, he had put me in that situation. He had put me in my abusive marriage. He had also made sure that instead of going to beauty school, that I was put at DePaul University where they discovered that I was good at writing and good at speaking. So I ended up in the journalism program. I just hadn't been able to pursue a career in writing. So here I was at the end of this marriage with all this wisdom, I suppose, that I had learned throughout. And I had the ability to verbalize that and accurately, accurately express that. So that's what I did. I took my journal and I made the story of, of what had happened to me and, you know, hoping that I could reach another woman or maybe even men, because this happens to men too, you know, so that maybe they would understand sure. they're not alone, but also to know that there are consequences. You're not being noble by disrespecting your body. You're not doing any, you know, faithful thing by staying in a situation that's killing you because nobody was meant to suffer like that. You know, and more importantly, I wanted to serve as an example of, you know, being able to come out of the circumstances and at 45 years old, start completely over in life as a single mother, you know, a, with a kid about to go off to college himself. And, that I could rise above everything because the beauty is it's been only three years and four months since the divorce. And I have made a lot of changes in that time. I mean, my son and I have, you know, probably within a six month period, you know, we moved, he graduated from high school, he went to college, I got remarried, I, all these, all these things happened. But boy, are we resilient because we're standing strong and honestly, we're doing better than ever. And I don't think that's unique to me. I think everybody has the ability to do that. They just have to choose that and and realize that maybe all these impediments to their to their life or their, whatever hindrances they've they've had to overcome, maybe they were put there for a reason. Because I truly believe that the first 45 years of my life was meant exactly to be what it was so that it could prepare me to be able to understand things in a way and, and express them in a way that other people couldn't because it's helping a lot of people now. And I'm so grateful for that. 
I'm always curious to somebody who does get out of a situation like that. How did you do it? Because you seem like you're trapped in a house with someone who who's threatened to do you harm. How do you, how did you get out of that mm -hmm. for people who are listening going, I, I want to get out. I know I need to get out, but maybe something about the way you got out may inspire someone else. Well, I got lucky to be honest. However, I was preparing because I did not think I was going to get lucky. Um, so I will briefly explain first how I was preparing. Um, it's unfortunate I was preparing for about 15 years because I just, uh, I was hoping for change, of course, but um, when none was affected, I knew I had to just be prepared. When you are in a situation, and certainly I have heard some horrific stories of, of people that have been in much, much worse situations than I was in, but I think I've always told my son, the number one rule of life is to be prepared. And so what I did, and it's such a simple thing, but I ordered from Walmart uh, for $50. They have a little fireproof, waterproof safe that has a handle. It's not much bigger than a purse that a woman would carry. And, and you know, it has some weight to it, but it's I, I was 93 pounds and I could carry it just fine. But what I did was I was stashing money away in there. You know, when grandma would send me $30 for my birthday, I'd put it in there or, you know, whatever. If I got bonus at work, I'd put it in there. I was making sure I had, and it didn't matter if it was $100 or $10,000, just have something to know that my son and I, if we had to pick up and run, we could eat. Maybe I could afford a hotel room somewhere. We could go to Goodwill and buy clothes. I just needed something. So I stashed money, but what I also put in there, which is more important, is all of our documents, you know, like our birth certificates. I don't think I needed my passport, but I put it in there anyway. Just anything that I didn't have to worry about coming back to the house for, because if we were in a situation and I needed to grab and go, I needed to grab and go. I need, I could replace clothes. I could replace things. Anything can be replaced, but my life and my son's life could not be replaced. But unfortunately, if you want to go and, and you know access anything or or open accounts you do need to have some pertinent information so i just thought it was really important like i photocopied even my driver's license put it in there um any kind of records that i have like financial accounts i made a list of all my passwords you know for things just anything that's super important that i didn't have to return for went in that little safe and i hid it he didn't know I had it. I even moved the hiding place every so often so that just in case he might have discovered it, you know, he but he needed a key to get in it, which was a whole other thing. And I hid the key. Um, and I also alerted a safe person. And that's the other thing I'm going to suggest is have a safe person. Um, what I did with my safe person, number one, was I made sure that she knew where my safe and the key was at all times. So that if something happened to me, she would at least be able to access those things for my, you know, as far as having guardianship for my son. And that's the other thing I did as well is I made sure that somebody was set up as a guardian legally for my son because I didn't want it to be the man I was married to. And our marriage was just legal at that point. Um, but I was terrified, you know, that he would, you know have to raise my son if something happened to me and I, I over my dead body literally was I going to allow that so I established guardianship legally he didn't have to know anything about that he never did probably still doesn't know but I just kind of put everything in place um I also set up with the safe person that every morning by let's say I think it was 9 a.m I had to make sure to to text or email her in some way to say we're good. Have a great day. If she was not, if she had not heard from me, she was to alert authorities to do a wellness check. So having these things in place at least made me know that we were prepared to escape at any time if we had to. And if something did happen to me, I knew my son was the beneficiary to my accounts and my life insurance and that he had a guardian set up for that purpose. Um, you know, so everything would be taken care of the way that I wanted it to. Um, I realized that it's much more difficult 
for people with multiple children or you know maybe you don't have somebody you can go to but i promise you in every community there is somebody willing to step up for you whether it's at your church at your work a family member somebody is willing to help you love that you would use a term in your in the heading of your book a narcissistic abuse can you define what that is i've heard of abuse before but i not heard those two words those two yeah well i'm glad you asked that because a lot of people get messed up by the term. All it is is when a narcissist abuses you. The problem with narcissistic abuse specifically is that narcissists will use any and all methods of abuse to manipulate you. So like in my childhood, honestly, looking back, I mean, there is no question my stepfather is absolutely the king of all narcissists. However, the man I married the first time around is what we call a covert narcissist. So his narcissism was expressed differently. He, he was more subtle and seemingly humble about the way that he went about getting this admiration and praise from others. Um, but they will use physical abuse, verbal, psychological, emotional, um, legal abuse, sexual abuse, financial abuse. There are so many abuses, and, and that doesn't even include the manipulation tactics like the silent treatment and gaslighting. Um, they isolate their victims, you know, keeping them away from friends and family, keeping them away from outside influence, and like me, even moving them, you know, very far away from everyone and everything so that they are the only one. You depend on them for social interaction, for love and affection, for direction, for guidance to basically dictate everything, every part of your life down to what you say, what you can do, what you can wear, what you can read. It is so restrictive in so many ways. And, and, you know, it's no wonder that I felt dead inside because myself, my, my unique um, personality and the, the things that made me who I was were taken away. You know, he wanted a Stepford wife, basically just like my stepfather had wanted, you know, me to play this role a certain way, you know, to come off as his daughter and not as a stepdaughter. Nobody was supposed to know. And I had to deny my Puerto Rican heritage and I had to deny my biology. And there's nothing wrong with being exactly who you are. And, you know, that's another takeaway from all this is that people need to understand that if somebody ever wants to change you, um, or make you different than, than who you are, flaws and all, then that's not a healthy relationship to be in. But certainly there is a spectrum of narcissism. And I want to be clear about that as well. I always liken it to tumors because it's something people can understand. When you have a benign tumor in your body, it's just there. It's not bothering you. Those are like the people that, you know, really the perception of narcissism that's commonly known. Um, these are the people on social media that are taking pictures of themselves and they do look fabulous. You cannot <laughs> hate on them. Might be annoying at times, but, you know, they really right. do look good. And, and in fact, the word narcissist comes from the name of the Greek god Narcissus, who stared at his reflection in the pond because he was just so in love with how he looked. But this other aspect of narcissism, which is unfortunately the part that I've had to deal with multiple times, are like malignant tumors, malignant narcissists. They cause you problems. They might even kill you. And you have to remove them. There is no way out of a relationship with them except to just cut them out completely. That's very helpful to define it because I know people are going, I know a nurse is, I need to be careful, you may be abusive. So I'm glad you you separate those two things. Yeah. Absolutely. For, and you know, and I tell people too not to get too caught up in the labels and the names because your moral compass is gonna tell you what's right and wrong. And if somebody's not treating you right, I don't care what you call it, wrong is wrong. Abuse is abuse. Exactly. There are people listening to this podcast going, why do people stay? And I think that's the hardest question for those who have not gone through it is, why don't you just leave? Can you just kind of help people who don't understand 
why people don't get away, why they get stuck in those situations. Absolutely. There's two parts to that answer. The first part is applicable to anybody in any situation. You know, the thing is, narcissists aren't always just in romantic relationships. They're your boss at work. They might even be, you know, the coach of your kid's little league team. They're they're everywhere in your community. They're at your church. They're they're all over the place. They're in your family. It's not easy to walk away. I when I was a child and my narcissistic stepfather was abusing me, I couldn't walk away. Even when child services got involved, guess what? Child services sent me back home because they wow. didn't believe me because my mother and stepfather put on an act, you know, that oh poor them with the difficult daughter who's accusing them of these horrible things. So, you can't get out sometimes. Now as an adult, if we're talking about a romantic relationship, whether it be a partnership or a marriage of some sort, again, obvious reasons. If you have kids, I mean, you know, I only had one, but still I, I was not leaving without my child. And at that point, he was a teenager. I couldn't just pick him up like a two-year-old and put him on my hip and walk out. And even though he saw what was going on, I couldn't be sure he was going to come with me. But I, there was no way I was leaving him either. Um, there are also, you know, financial reasons. Not everybody can say, oh, yeah, I'll just go have a place to live over here and pay my own rent and pay my own, you know, utilities and I can afford food and a whole other life. Most people, they say in this country, are $400 away from bankruptcy, according to a study from last year. So, how are people going to afford another place to live? Women specifically are afraid that the spouse that they have left is going to retaliate by taking custody of the children. And that happens a few too many times. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but I, I, you know, I understand it works both ways, whether you're a mother or a father, but the thought of not being, in, you know, there when my son woke up every morning and went to bed every night, it just was not comprehensible to me. And then there's other factors too. Your families are intertwined, like I said, your finances, but you also have to think about, I, I don't even talk about this in my book, but we lived on a farm. We had cows, pigs, and chickens. And I had a dog that had epilepsy and had seizures, grand mal seizures every day. And she had lymphoma. Where was oh, I going to wow. take her? No <laughs> shelter was going to let me bring this sick dog. Yeah. We didn't have enough room in the book for that, but I mean, I was not leaving her behind because, you know, usually when people are abusive to other humans, they're also abusive to animals. Um, it's definitely prevalent. So there was no way. And I was not going to put her down just because, you know, this man was who he was. That wasn't fair to her. Um, you know, so there's a gazillion reasons. But now the other side of that is what we call a trauma bond. And I'm sure some people have heard of this. And that's something that's very difficult to explain to somebody that has not endured one. But it's basically when your abuser, there's always this push and pull. They love you. They have manipulated in, you into a, a situation where you know that after those rough times, they're going to tell you they love you. They're going to tell you they promise to be better and they're so sorry and everything else, or, or maybe they don't. But, you know, you have come to be manipulated to think that basically the sun rises and sets with them. You are nothing and nobody without them. You can't be anything without them. You will never survive out in the world without them. And I know this sounds ridiculous to people because even in my life, I had I had a couple of people come up to me and say, oh, you need to be stronger. And I took offense to that because I was no, I'm not a weak, I'm not a weak woman. It takes a stronger woman or man to stay in a situation like that every damn day of their life, excuse me, but it's suffering. It is a suffering nobody can understand. And you do it because you're trying to keep peace for your child. You're trying to keep peace for yourself and maintain some sense of sanity. And you are hoping and you are praying that this person grows up or has some epiphany that, you know, that the, they're wrong to go about life this way and that everything will be okay. And in the midst of all this misery, 
they are loving you and they're making these promises. And so this bond that's created in going through these horrible instances of abuse and then feeling these overwhelming emotions of love and like everything's going to be okay and they're holding you and you, I mean, I even said at one point in my book, which sounds crazy to people that haven't been there, but at one point I felt unsafe and it's like I ran back home to him, the man who was strong arming me and who intimidated me and threatened me and, and wanted me dead, but I felt safe with him and within the confines of our house because I was made to feel that way. I was made to feel that that was just, that was my home. That was that was my security there with him. So yeah. to tell somebody that's like taking a baby away from its mother, um, you know, to say, oh, just leave or why didn't you just leave? It doesn't, it, you want to, you know, it's not right. You want things to be different. You don't want to live that way. But you're, it, there's actually even chemical, uh, you know, responses in your body that are like addictions. It's like telling an alcoholic to eh, just stop drinking beer, just stop drinking the alcohol. Or, th it doesn't work that way. You, you actually mentally and, and biologically are addicted in a way to this person and to that situation. Yes, because I want to get to the hope part, because there is a good side that came out of it for you. Yes, yes. What did a healing <laughs> process look like for you? It's not pretty. I don't want to. I think people think that they're going to decide I'm going to heal now and they're going to go to sleep and some magical fairy dust is going to be sprinkled upon them <laughs> and they'll wake up smiling and it's sunshine and rainbows. And oh, I wish it was that way. It's nasty. It's ugly. It's like it's like the earth opens up under you and, and, and the spawns of hell come in and reach up and drag you down into it. When you decide to heal, first of all, I'm going to tell everybody what worked for me and what I really highly recommend is make sure that you are in the right space physically, like your environment and mentally where you feel safe. Because healing's not not for the, the, the weak minded or the weary. It's not something you can do if you're still in that toxic situation. That would be like asking a flower to grow and bloom in dry soil with no sunshine and no water. It's not possible. So you need to be safe. Um, I could not even think about starting to heal until I was moved out of the house that we shared. The divorce was done. There was no contact. I needed to be completely away from the situation physically. And then mentally, because I was now in a place where I felt safe and I had people surrounding me that I knew would not abandon me or reject me for whatever occurred and however I might act or, or react um, to the healing process, then I was ready to begin. And where I started was with myself. I always like to start things um, with some good premise, a good foundation. So I had to start by, you know, people call it self-love, but it was just, I, I called it depositing just little happy things into my happy jar every day. And it's just little stuff you can do at home. Like maybe I didn't want to cook dinner. Maybe I just wanted a pint of butter pecan ice cream. <laughs> instead. And I indulged that. And if I wanted to paint my nails or if I wanted to just go take a walk along the river and just hear the birds and listen to the water and just be present with nature and, and calm and soothe myself, whatever it is, just give yourself those little doses of happiness. Because if you're in a good place mentally, you're going to be better able to go through the healing. But the healing itself is different for everybody. But you're basically sticking your hand right in the lion's mouth. You are voluntarily going back in your head to the core and just digging deeper and deeper and deeper into everything that happened to you, trying to understand it, make sense of it, see different perspectives on it, even see how you might have been contributing to it or participating in it. 
um, unconsciously. And, and so you can understand how not to do that in the future and how not to get caught in these terrible um, dynamics, you know, in another relationship. So it's an ugly thing, but, but there are so many options for people now. I think people traditionally think about talk therapy, but you know, again, not everybody can afford something like that. And it's not effective. It wouldn't have been effective for me to rehash all these things with somebody who may or may not have understood it. I think it's just a matter of doing what resonates with you. As a writer, writing therapy was ridiculously effective. And I think also letting myself, putting myself intentionally in situations with people who were going to trigger me and upset me and cause me to feel the anxiety that I was feeling um, was forcing me to self-regulate and forcing me to deal with really heavy feelings and really intense reactions, even physically. Um, but the more I did it, the more I was able to overcome it. And the more I was able to overcome it, the stronger I felt inside and, and, you know, the taller I stood and, you know, having that, that love for yourself and that respect for yourself and then finding that strength within yourself, boy, that's something nobody can take from you, no matter who it is. And that will definitely keep you out of those situations in the future. So now you've gone through all of that. I'm curious, what are you most excited about in this season of your life? You know, I think I'm just excited that I have options and that I'm free to do as I please. Because, you know, going back to my personal, I, I spent 45 years of my life having everything, everything dictated to me. This was what I was going to do. This is what I was studying in school. This is what I was going to do for work. Like I said, down to, you know, my ex would tell me what lipstick I could and couldn't wear and what music I could and couldn't listen to. And he didn't like me reading books. I didn't even have a smartphone until after that marriage. And, you know, to be free, I mean, I'm a grown woman. I'm college educated. I've traveled the world. Like I can make my own decisions. I'm of sound mind and, and everybody, I think, um, is free to live the life that they want. And I love that at 45, I could start over as a single mother and created in, you know, three years time, the life that I had always wanted. I had always wanted to write and I published a book. I'm, I've got two more books I've already written that are coming out later this year. If I ever get done with the revision, re revisions that the publisher wants on them. And you know, I, I am remarried and in a very surprisingly healthy relationship. I wasn't even sure I was capable of having a healthy relationship romantically. Um, and I am. And I'm just so grateful that this man had been there all along. I just had never seen it. Not that I should have because I was busy being married and dealing with a lot of other stuff. But, you know, it's such a beautiful thing to be able to just write a new chapter, so to speak, and just say, okay, that stuff happened. It definitely taught me a lot, taught me lots of lessons, and it made me who I am. And I'm not ashamed of any of it. I'm not ashamed for how I lived and what I dealt with and what I endured, nor am I ashamed for the consequences of any of it. I think, again, we're all uniquely different and and it's our flaws and our strengths and you know, everything we have to offer the world that makes each one of us so beautiful inside and what we outwardly express, you know, to others is, is just even more astounding. So I think it's just having that vision and, and going for it. I don't care who you are, where you are. One of the most inspiring people I've met recently was an 83 year old man that decided when he was 80 years old that he was going to publish one book a year. And at 83, he has published three books so far, and he is, wow. he is continuing on. And I love that spirit because so many of us limit ourselves or we let other people or societal, you know, expectations or, you know, restrictions in and of itself tell us what we can and can't do. But you're in charge, you know, 
other than God, God, God is giving you the tools. I mean, am I ever going to go to the moon? Probably not. You know, it, it <laughs> sounds fun to be an astronaut, but I'm not a science person. And I don't know if I want to go that far out of our atmosphere, but I was born to write. I was born to communicate something always wanted to do. And here I am doing it. And it was always in me. It was just a matter of me deciding that I was going to indulge what I had always wanted and go for it, no matter what the consequences or what my resources were. If it's meant to be, you will find a way and it'll happen. That leads me to my last question for you. And I love to ask my guests this question. Okay. What do you want your legacy to be? That's a that's a big question. I that's think my legacy <laughs> is just yeah, I I bet. You know, my legacy, I I think more than anything, of course, I think of my son when I think of a legacy and I want him to look at his mom and look back at my life and just be proud of me that I didn't let all the naysayers tell me that I wasn't meant to be alive and that I shouldn't have ever been born. And that even though my mother, you know, has said that she would have had an abortion if we, if she could have, I was meant to be here and I'm okay. I've experienced pain. I've experienced regret. I've, we've all been through stuff, but I was meant to be here and I'm doing exactly what my purpose has always been. And I'm happy. My soul is at peace and I'm settled and, and blessed in so many ways. Just took me a little longer to get there. Whereas some people get it a little earlier in their life. But, but I think people need to understand that no matter what you've been through, you can, you can get past it. You can move forward from it and you can smile and you can experience joy and you can be you. I don't like hearing people say I'm broken. I'm damaged. I suffered. I'm a victim. No, live your life, live your life joyfully, live your life fully experience life as you were meant to experience it. Don't limit yourself with those negative thoughts. I just think it's really important to just move forward and everybody has it within them. That's great. So where can listeners find your book, Grasping for Air, The Stranglehold of Narcissistic Abuse, and connect with you on social media? Absolutely. Um, you can go on, and most people go on Amazon. We all love our Amazon driver. Um, or you can, the ebook is also available on Amazon or go to my website, DanaSDiaz.com. The link to buy the book is there. You can also access my Facebook and Instagram links. I do post content every single day. Some is helpful, some is funny, some are resources, but I just try to, you know, have our community of people together, whether you're somebody that has experienced some form of trauma or abuse, or just somebody who wants to be there to support others um, in, in their healing journey. Um, it's really important that, you know, as humans, we all, you know, serve each other and, and help each other and support each other to get there. Well, Dana, thank you for filling this space and being a resource for people who are going through some of the things you went through, but also reminding them that there is something on the other side sometimes. And so to look for that, to prepare for it, and to give them encouragement that you can do that. I'm so glad you're there to kind of give people that, that push to move forward. So thank you for what you do. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Dana.